This episode is brought to you by Vertical Farming Weekly. Each week, our team member Noah brings you the latest and greatest in the world of vertical farming, including updates when episodes go live. Sign up today at verticalfarmingweekly.com. This podcast is produced by Fullcast, our full service done for you podcast agency. If you are interested in learning how a podcast would be beneficial for your brand, learn more at fullcast.co. If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Visit cultivated.com to learn more. And that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com or click the link in the show notes. A lot of them were in their 20s at the time and early 30s and smart women, a lot of them from science, technology, engineering, and math just really wanting and passionate about tackling issues related to climate sustainability. And also some of them were frustrated with working at companies where their ideas were just not being allowed to get out there. So they're just like, why don't I hang my own shingle? Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ag tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 6, we are underway. Welcome back. If this is your first episode listening, welcome, welcome. We do everything we can to roll out the red carpet, or maybe it should be the green carpet. <laughs> For anyone that's new to the space, if you've sent someone here, if someone sent you here, I'm grateful for both counts. It's the show where we interview fascinating CEOs and founders of the leading vertical farming companies from around the world. I'm your host, Harry Duran. In case you missed our last episode, our kickoff inaugural episode, it was with Inez Sagradio, co-founder at Econoki. I was grateful to meet Inez at Indoor Ag Tech NYC, and she shared the work she's doing at Econoki with hops of all things. It's the first time I've heard hops being grown indoors. And I knew when we met that I was going to be inviting her to the show. And I'm glad I did. We had a great conversation, sharing our experience as entrepreneurs. We talked about the power of strategic analysis and how the industry is evolving. She naturally shared her passion for hops, sustainability, and talks about the relationship with her co-founder, Anna. So make sure you check that out if you have not done so already. If you have, and you haven't left us a rating and a review, what are you waiting for? Head on over to ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. And as promised, I'll be sure to read those out on future episodes. Okay, keeping in the vibe of powerful women founders, I'm really excited to share this episode with you. It's with Amy Wu of From Farms to Incubators. And she joins the show today to share her mission of highlighting women in food, farming and ag tech, especially women of color. She's an entrepreneur, a storyteller, and an award-winning writer for the women's ag and ag tech movement. And in this episode, she talks about the work she's doing to tell the stories of women innovators and leaders in ag tech. She reflects on her time as an investigative journalist, breaks down current issues such as food security, inflation, and everything that's happening with supply chain, which is definitely a topic that's been near and dear to a lot of the guests uh, on this show. And she also speaks to the power of representation, which is also very, very important for me. So I'm really happy I got to share her story with you. Before we jump into this amazing, uninterrupted conversation, here's a couple of words from the folks that support this show. This episode is brought to you by Vertical Farming Weekly. Each week, our team member Noah brings you the latest and greatest in the world of vertical farming, including updates when episodes go live. Sign up today at verticalfarmingweekly.com. This podcast is produced by Fullcast, our full service done for you podcast agency. If you are interested in learning how a podcast would be beneficial for your brand, learn more at fullcast.co. So Amy Wu, founder of From Farms to Incubators, thank you for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thank you for having me today. So what's fascinating about this show since I started in 2020 is the different paths that it's taken me on. I've attended my first two conferences in indoor farming this year. I was at Indoor AgCon in Las Vegas, and then where we met briefly at Indoor AgTech NYC in Brooklyn. 
And what was ex exciting for me is just to start to meet some of my past guests firsthand and then get a feel for what's happening in the space. And I, I don't know what your experience has been with these conferences, but what I loved about Indoor Ag Tech NYC was the fact that it was single track. So we got to attend, I mean, if you were there for the whole thing for the two days, you got to see pretty much everyone speak and you got to have enough time to mingle in the breakout session. So I'm just curious what your experience was after uh, the conference. Yeah, well, thank you very much again, Harry, for having me here today. It's such an honor. Yeah, and it was great seeing you at the conference. So the, you know, the Interactive Conference, actually, I thought was a real, real highlight of the various conferences that I've been to. Perhaps part of it is because it had been so long since I've been to an in-person conference since the pandemic. So I would say it's one of my first big conferences since 2020. I will say that I loved that there were just some really important discussions related to the future of indoor ag tech and kind of crystal balling it. I mean, no pun intended, I guess, you know, I did moderate the panel on the crystal ball session, which ended the conference. But it's interesting to sure. take a look at some of the major issues that consumers, society are facing when it comes to food production, food supply, and how indoor farming, and then maybe the subset of ag tech in indoors will help address issues like that. So I want to get into a little bit of uh, your background for folks that are regular listeners to the show. They know I'm, I'm a big fan of origin stories. So to start with, where's home for you currently? Uh, home for me is in the Hudson Valley region in New York. It's about 100 miles north of New York City. Okay. And New York, I'm originally from New York, actually, the state. I'm a native uh, New Yorker, East Coaster. So this is home for me. So home for me currently is in Minneapolis, but I've only been here since 2019. Home for me is actually, I would consider New York. So I grew up in Yonkers. I grew up in Yonkers, New York. Okay. Well, and uh, it's always had some very familiar with <laughs> the East Coast as well. And then I, I had, I was four years in LA as well. But so I've been in a couple of big cities. This is my first time in the Midwest, but I do have a special place in my heart for the East Coast and specifically New York and the Hudson Valley. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm originally, actually, was born, raised in Westchester County, so I'm pretty familiar with Young. Yeah. I went to an all-boys Catholic high school in White Plains, <laughs> Archbishop Stepanak. Okay. Yes, I'm familiar with Stepanak as well. Yeah. So, obviously, from taking a look at your LinkedIn profile, your background is in journalism. Was that your intent when you went to school and just coming out of university? That was your passion, that you were going to be involved in journalism from the beginning? Well, I knew a couple things when I was in high school or even younger middle school was that I was encouraged to write. And I started journalism unintentionally when I was in middle school and the English teacher said to me, you're a really good writer. The assignment had been to write about a topic to the local newspaper. And I wrote a letter about the importance of Earth Day. And it was published in the local paper. My photograph is there. And I just I oh, wow. felt like a star, like a celebrity on one hand. But I also figured out very quickly that writing and media gives you a lot of power to get, to get really important issues across to a big audience. So I actually thought you could write letters to the editor for a living for a long time and then realize that, no, not really. I don't think anybody's made a living doing that, but you could make a living as a journalist. And it fit my personality pretty well. I think I'm in my nature is to be a, curi is a curious person. And I tend to ask a lot of questions because I'm curious, genuinely curious. Yeah. Somebody once told me that there is no stupid question. And as an investigative reporter for a long time, the mantra was like, even if your mother says that you're gorgeous, check it out or something. <laughs> I guess, you know, there's also never a dull moment, I feel like, in what I call storytelling. And I was fortunate and just that several years, I mean, a number of years ago now, I was given a phone call from an editor at the USA Today Network who said, do you want to write about for agriculture and local government? in the Salinas Valley. And I took the opportunity. I think a lot of things in life is timing. And I accepted the opportunity. And that's what led me on my path to writing about women, women innovators in ag tech. 
I know that from all the different jobs you've had in journalism, I saw that you worked at Gannett as well. So that just brought like a big flashback of me or my parents getting the Herald Statesman <laughs> delivered to their house as well. What were some of the maybe one or two highlights from your time there? And not specifically at the one job, but just your, your time as in journalism and specifically in investigative journalism. So, yeah, I can tie this into a little bit on, on the ag tech aspect of this for listeners, I think, as well, in that... I think my background, like I said, I first covered agriculture and ag tech in Salinas, which is the vegetable bowl of the world, which the ag industry is ten and worth at least ten billion dollars, and about eighty five percent of the leafy greens that we eat are grown there. The investigative part really was in really wanting to tell untold, undertold stories. And I'm also a history major. I majored in history at NYU. And I felt strongly about giving voice to communities and to stories that just were not told. And the reason why they're not told, I find often, is because maybe the media, mass media, is not interested in them immediately. It's too kind of esoteric. Back in 2015, ag tech was just this really weird word. Not a lot of people had heard about it, actually. was really, And I'm going to argue that even today, it still has not hit the peak quite yet, you know? But back then in 2015, 2016, very few people, investors even had heard about ag tech. Farmers had not really too much heard about ag tech. Farmers would just be like, yeah, I use equipment and technology, but I don't know what you're really talking about yet. And But it was starting. So the journalist in me immediately kind of observed all of this and living in the Salinas Valley and being surrounded by farming and vegetables and being at the forefront of what I consider Salinas Valley to be the, one of the birthplaces for ag tech because it's so close to Silicon Valley, a lot of intersections with investors who are also some early investors in ag tech. And there was a new center uh, from the Western Center Growers of Innovation and Technology that had launched for ag tech startups. So I, the question that emerged was how many women innovators are in that center and how many are minorities? So I kept asking, I was just curious, like how many are led by women? How many were co-founded by women? How many of these women are women of color? And everybody who I asked kind of gave me a blank stare. Like, I don't know why you're asking this and I don't understand like what you're looking for. And I think that was what really led me to keep asking the question. And I really wanted to amplify, like I was convinced somewhere in me that there were definitely companies startups being launched or led by women who are creating innovations to tackle farming challenges. It was a real in, strong intuition. So I applied for a grant at the International Center for Journalists. They were looking for stories of minority business women owners. I mean, that's a mouthful. But anyway, it was good timing. I applied. I got the grant. And then my problem actually was a challenge was to find the women in two months to create a documentary and to also write some profiles. I think it was sheer persistence and drive that kind of led me into the project. And so I'm just curious in terms of like the thought process when you have the idea, because originally you go out there to do a story on on farming in Salinas. And then obviously you you have this other question now about what female found, where the female representation and minority representation. And it's interesting too, because I'm actually Latino. I was born in El Salvador and I was conscious as I started this show like as I started interviewing CEOs and founders, I was like, well, there's a lot of white males yeah. <laughs> who are telling great stories, but it was just something that I was conscious of. So, and I've made a more of a concerted effort to do that on this show. And I think it's something you probably discovered as well. Like you have to work a little bit harder to find those stories, to find those people, to make those connections to folks. Yeah, I can relate to what you're talking about. I mean, first of all, I don't come from a farming background. I don't come from a family of farmers or I don't come from agriculture. I don't come from the world of food ecosystems either. I grew up in the suburbs and I grew up, I did not visit probably my first farm until I was in my, well into my twenties, maybe even thirties. I mean, I thought a farm was just full of maybe pigs and goats and there was going to be a tractor definitely somewhere and a farmer in overalls and a pitchfork or something. I mean, in other words, there was a certain image And I grew up at a time when, unfortunately, on our curriculum, we didn't have a garden. 
we didn't have a community garden and we didn't, I actually thought that the food grew out of supermarket aisles for a long time. And there wasn't this real, where does my food come from? Who's growing it? So it wasn't until I was sent to the Salinas Valley that I made, there was this emotional connection like, oh, when I go through my supermarket aisles, when I visit and I see this bag salad, oh my gosh, it's actually like, those are the people that are now harvesting it. And when I go to the supermarket now and I look at where it's being grown, I do feel this connection. And it's not just Salinas Valley. It's really across the U.S. Every region in the U.S. specializes, has a special geography that is really good for certain kind of crops and certain kinds of agriculture. So I think it was just a great, greater appreciation for how important farming is to our livelihood and also a real appreciation for the farmer's And it's such a timely issue because of the food supply issue that now we're facing with the inflation and the rising cost of food and the access, the challenges to access to food now as well. And I think the timing of this is probably at the time you started it, but it seems to be top of mind for a lot of folks. I started the show in 2020 in March, right when COVID hit. And it was interesting how the topic of food security, this issues with the supply chain, food deserts, all these topics started coming to the surface and people were having conversations, even with Ukraine, access to the supply chain, impact to food supplies. It feels like now more than ever, these conversations about where our food is coming from, access to it, who's grow- growing it, how sustainable yeah. these, these supply chains are. It feels like that's a, a conversation a lot of people are having now. I think, you know, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, and also just what that had created in terms of not just the pandemic, but now what we're seeing with inflation and also with just the cost of shipping transportation with getting the food, right, from A to B to C to D, is something that has hit all of us, our pocketbooks, basically. So consumers really care about why is it that last, like five months ago, the eggs were two ninety nine, and now they're four ninety nine. dollars It's really something that's come to life for everyone. Why are the cherries now? Why is a one pound cherry $15, right? So I think that's really creating questions to people who don't even know anything about farming as to why this is happening. An appreciation for locally grown food. As well, I see that there's a growing number of CSAs, people subscribing to CSAs and going to farmers markets, finding and growing their own food. I think people are also growing their own food, which gets back to vertical farming and indoor. So I'm curious, Amy, as when you started spending time out there and started discovering some of these women in the farming space, when did you start to piece together what this would start to look like? And when did the idea come to you for turning this into a film? Well, the grant was really what created the film because I answered that call out from the International Center for Journalists for stories of minority women business owners, and I got a grant. I don't know what really sparked my idea for a documentary. I think part of it was I had, I just, I love doc, I love movies. I had never done a documentary before. What the grant afforded me was to hire a young videographer who uh, was fresh from UC Berkeley Journalism School and who was very hungry to also work on a good project. So I got really lucky. I think a lot of things in life are about good timing. So I just, the stars aligned and he did a really good job. And I also was lucky enough to find three or four women who would share their stories. So the film was an eye opener when it first screened at the Western Center for Innovation and Technology in 2017, I created this event. My boss and I at the time at at the Gannett paper, we invited community leaders, policymakers, farmers from Salinas Valley. We invited educators for this evening screening. And I invited all of the women who were in the film to sit with me. And to, I was the moderator. And there was just this like silence after the film screened. And I was just like, huh, are people, what are they thinking? Are they just not liking it? Or people just start to clap and their hands went up. And they said, I had no idea that there was, there are a new generation of women who are doing this? Like, who would have known that there is they're creating innovations to help farmers, like tackle issues like drought, water and land management, lack of farmable soil, and women in their twenties. A lot of them were in their twenties at the time and early thirties, and they were fascinated. And they were and these women, smart women, a lot of them from science, technology, engineering, and math. So just really wanting and passionate about tackling issues related to climate 
sustainability. And also some of them were frustrated with working at companies where their ideas were just not being told, not being allowed to get out there. So they're just like, why don't I hang my own shingle? So I think it was just really good timing to introduce the system. I didn't know what it would become. All I know is that every time the film would screen, people would just really just connect with it. And then I said to myself, I got more emails and more phone calls asking me to profile more women. And then I said to myself, by 2018, I had screened the film probably 20, 30 times. And I said, I want to collect this. I want to collect the stories into the format of a book. So I had never written a book before, but people sometimes ask me why a book. And that's a good question because I actually had never written a book. But the book, why a book is because I actually really wanted to have something tangible and kind of what I, in my mind, said is lasting. Maybe it'll last 20, 30 years, 40 years. But in my mind, it was more lasting, right? I wanted to document their voices. I wanted to get their stories out to inspire younger women young people to say, hey, farming is not just tractors and overalls. It's not just like this image of you're a farmer that's not smart. Farmers are some of the smartest people I know. They're not just contending with weather. They're contending with science, research, equipment. It's amazing. So I wanted them to pick up this book and say, huh, maybe I can consider work and job opportunities in ag tech. So it was really meant to inspire, to document, to celebrate women, There's still not enough women in ag tech. There's still not enough money, I think, being invested in a lot of women-led companies. We can talk about the reasons why I think the case, why that's the case. But I just, uh, I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to at least have people start asking questions. Well, one that I'm going to ask is just just continuing that thread. What are your thoughts about why there aren't more women in ag tech? Well, part of it is, like I noted, that traditionally agriculture has been farms have been passed down from generation to generation. The land has been passed down from generation to generation, to grandfather to father, fathers to sons, and really not traditionally to daughters. That's changing though, also. So part of the, the problem is that women really have not been at the forefront of being, this is a male, very male dominated industry agriculture, right? So when it comes to ag tech, agriculture and technology, it's not a surprise to me that there are just not a lot of investors that are investing women in women-led companies. Part of it too is that a lot of venture capital company uh, firms, a lot of investors, the key leaders are men, right? So I think you kind of just like get to know yeah. the people you get to know and you kind of like are in your circle. You're used to what you're used to. So when somebody's different comes along, maybe they're younger, maybe they're a woman, maybe they look differently, maybe they're pitching an idea. I think it's just like, oh, interesting, but something different. And whether or not people accept differences or it takes time to adapt to change. And the other issue is that I think that there, for a long time, there hasn't been a community for women in ag tech either. So I think it takes connections, networking and a community to build something bigger So that's why Farms to Incubators has been trying to create more events, more we partner with the organizations to give women the opportunity to befriend each other, connect with one another. It could be cocktails. It could be networking hour. A lot of the 30 women in my book are a community of their own. And each one of them has said, I want to connect with the other woman. 30 women time, and then you get it kind of snowballs, right? So I strongly believe that networking and community is critical. I also think that accelerators and incubators are also really important to serve as a platform to allow women and those traditionally not in agriculture to get into the field as well. How much have you grown to understand and appreciate the space since starting your research for the film? I've grown a tremendous respect for uh, those who farm, those who are, are participating in the food systems. I mean, let's talk about farmers it's just not an easy life. It's a life that they enjoy to some extent, though, because I don't think anybody would really do that just to make money, a lot of money. It's very costly, everything from fertilizers to, you, like, I'm just trying to think, to seeds, to the equipment, very expensive. You don't make much money back, usually. A lot of this country is still made up of family farms. So I have a great respect for their intelligence and their passion for doing what they do. 
I know people farming all the way up until their 60s, 70s, 80s even. And they're doing it because they they just, it's like a religion to them. It's like that this is what they believe in. And then there's a new generation of younger people who are very interested in farming. They want to become farmers and own their own farms. Not because, oh, to just say I'm a farmer, but because they want to actually contribute to the ecosystem, the food ecosystem. They want to grow, use good, healthy strategies to grow food, right? They want to actually contribute back to society by producing healthy food. Yeah. How much were you aware and did you start to educate yourself on what was happening in the indoor farming space? So I'm going to be candid about this. I, I think indoor farming is still a new area for me because a lot of the farms that I've written about previously or I had visited were definitely not indoor farms. But I will say a couple of things is that I think indoor farming is critical to food production. And I kind of place it in a couple of different silos. I mean, there's vertical farming, but I think there's also greenhouse, growing in greenhouses, obviously, and hoop houses and so forth. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunities for people who are, just want to grow their own food to grow indoors in a greenhouse, in their own apartments and so forth. There's innovation that's going to really be needed, that is really needed to make that happen as well. I think it's an essential part of food production and supply because we're going to face a real crisis, I think, for comes to food supply. I think if there's no indoor farming or ag tech, along with that, we're going to be in trouble. I think that that is, I see it as another opportunity for women, young women, to get involved in ag tech as well. And I think probably to a guest that I've had on the show, everyone is seems to be in agreement that there's no one solution that's going to fix this problem. And it's not one specific type of indoor farm or outdoor farm. It feels like it's a concerted effort for everyone to be working together okay. and figure out what where their expertise lies and how they can contribute to this problem that's just going to be, be getting growing bigger and bigger as we deal with the issues around climate change as well. Right. I'm wondering in terms of your experience at the conference? Did you have a chance to check out some of the sessions? What were some of your takeaways or anything that you found that was new to you, Indoor Ag Tech NYC? Well, I was invited as a moderator for the final session. So that was a very good opportunity. And I think it was a very lively discussion, certainly from the panelists who are very high powered panelists, I guess, all representing some of them invest in from one from City Corps. One from local bounty. I mean, there's there were there were two other amazing panelists too. So what I feel like that to me was a highlight, really, because it's looking forward at how does why do we care about indoor? Why should we care about indoor ag tech, right? And what is the role yeah. it's going to play to our greater society? What are some of the challenges? I also want to highlight that I write a lot about agriculture from the lens of gender, Harry. So really. It's really a vehicle for me to actually amplify women leaders and women entrepreneurs. So going into a conference such as Indoor Act Tech, I always kind of eyeball and see what's the participation of women, women led companies, women representing their companies, women moderators. I didn't see, a, I mean, this time I visually just didn't see a lot of women. I mean, I was definitely a woman moderator, but anyway. I feel like in general, there are definitely more women participating in ag tech. It's all a positive. And I'm hoping that in indoor ag tech, it'll be the same case in the future, because I do think that there's a lot of women bring something special. We already contribute a lot to the food systems. We're often the head of the yeah. people buying and cooking the food. 60 to 80% of the food produced internationally, a woman plays a role in it, especially internationally on the farm. So anyway, yeah. I'm not sure that answers your question. I'd almost like to ask you about <laughs> indoor ag tech since you were there for a few days. Well, I mean, what was fascinating was the ability to hear from some of the newer opportunities that exist in the space to meet people that are doing interesting things in space that I was not aware of. I think Stephen Ritz stole the show with his presentation from Bronx Green Machine. His energy was really interesting. But and just to see this idea and to kind of a little bit to your point in terms of education, how inner city kids 
you know, he told the story of some of the folks that have gone through, kids that have gone through his program saying like, this is the first time I've ever had a salad. Right. Just awareness of things that we take for granted. And I grew up in Yonkers, not exactly New York City, but I lived, I've lived in New York City as well. And I'm very aware that to your point, growing up, you take some of these things for granted that you think your food comes from the supermarket shelves. Yeah. And it is that awareness that's helpful. I'm learning a little bit more about that here. My partners got us growing veggies in, the, in our backyard and I just made a cucumber and tomato salad oh, nice. and all the ingredients came from our backyard nice. and there's something really special about this consuming something that you grew yourself and i think that's a feeling that more people should have yeah that you're so nicely put i mean i myself am now a backyard i consider myself a, a newbie but when it comes to gardening but i have a started a garden myself about three years ago and i think it's so critical what you said about that love and that joy and that passion just to be connected to the land, I think, and also just seeing something that you produced. I mean, people put a lot of hard work into their gardens, actually, and to eat from that, I think, is also brings joy. So, yeah, excellent point, actually. And then the other thing that I'm aware of, and I, I think to the extent that I can help play a role in highlighting some of these stories. That's when I saw you at the conference. I was like, I got to practically chase you down in the hallway because <laughs> I was like, I got I to gotta make sure I get Amy because I wanted to share your story because as much as visibility as you've had with the documentary and with the book, I mean, if there's any other people that are not aware of the work that you're doing, by all means, if I have a little bit of a, a platform to share those stories, I go out of my way to look for women in the space as well. I reached out to Jennifer Waxman. I connected to her through your site. So I, I'm going to ask her to come on the show. So, you know, always looking to tell these stories because when I think of it as, you know, just a minority person of color, that there's something, and then also thinking about it from the woman's perspective, there's something powerful in any industry. When you see people that are like you doing something that you didn't know was possible, I think even if just like one little girl sees hears someone on the show or sees someone talk about farming or into farming or anything yeah. in that space, they'll know that that's possible, which I think is very powerful. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, Farms to Incubators is a growing, has gone from a documentary, gone from newspapers, a collection of newspaper stories into a book. And now actually I'm building a non-for-profit. It's a 501c3. It's a new, young non-for-profit 501c3 that focuses on storytelling Commute, building community, and also education and training. What is my goal and interest in this is that I'm really hoping that there will be more women who, who are at the table. It's as simple as that, really. Because, you know, like I said, a lot of people think that farming is still really boring and it's just tractors and overalls and being in the fields. I mean, it is a lot in the fields and that's true. And there's a lot of opportunity for work in the fields, but there's also a tremendous amount of opportunity in science and research and marketing and data and technology. I mean, you name it, you name it. And there is a place in the food system. So that's the message I'm really trying to send across. And I'm trying to do that by really amplifying women leaders and women entrepreneurs in the food space. And I'm trying to document their stories so that there's a trickle down effect of a new generation that can consider opportunities in that space as well. So really one piece leads to the other. And it's not as obvious as I'm hoping it is sometimes. I mean, I still get very people who, not young people, older people look at me quizzically. Like, I don't see, understand science, technology. Like, they're supposed to be engineers, right? And I go, yes, there's a lot of opportunities in engineering, but there's also a lot of STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, math, can also equal agriculture. Well, then I get a bounce back. Well, yes. agriculture, we're not a farmer, I mean, but then I say, well, the modern day farm also includes aerial drones that take images of fields. It includes yeah. AI, blockchain. And then I get, oh, blockchain, that's like cryptocurrency in the field, right? Yes, it's cryptocurrency, but it's also being used to trace food from the field to the big box store. In the case that, God forbid, there's some sort of contamination in the salad bags, they can trace it back. To the field. So, and then there's a lot of, oh, wow. It's the, oh, wow, interesting that I'm kind of hoping that from farms to incubators hoping to spark. And from the, oh, wow, interesting to the exploration to then, oh, I'd like to connect with so and so. So, from farms to incubators is really a hub to connect. I mean, I think of it as kind of like the port where the dongle, where the USBs go in. 
or where you can yeah. start your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. I think of us as that. We are connecting a lot of different kinds of devices together that are all interested actually in connecting with one another, actually. So that is what the role I yeah. see my role is. That's how I see the role of this growing, this small but powerful organization is trying to put together. I'm hoping to partner with other people who share a passion for it. Because I think that 10 years from now, everybody's going to know about ag tech and agri-food tech. It's just going to be part of agriculture, part of food. It's questionable whether or not it's going to be its own little, oh, wow, sector. It's just going to be part of our lives. Everyday life. Yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be more common people to be growing their food, yeah. not only in their garden, but it's people in the city growing food in their kitchen or people growing it in their garage with some of these grow towers. Yes, yeah, it's absolutely. Really interesting. I was never, I grew up in the suburbs and I went to school in the city. And up until maybe three or four years ago, when I told people that I was at working, I'm working at a farm, I write about farming. If my friends in the city would never, they wouldn't tell me they weren't interested, but they would be a little bit like, oh, oh, okay. Okay, cool. But now it's like, I'm a hot commodity. When I say that I'm in farming or in agriculture, I'm, look at this, look at the sweet corn. Oh my God, it's in a husk. This is like gold. I mean, they're like wide-eyed. They're like, let me come visit. Let me have my own farm. I mean, this is hot. And I'm hoping that it's not just going to be trendy, that actually this is going to just be permanent. Yeah, just a way of life. Lots of good things there. And I'm just really happy to share your story because I know it's going to be inspiring for folks to learn more about the space. I'm curious as someone who's in media, like what was that journey like for creating documentary? Like how long does that does a process like that take? So from the moment you came up with the idea to finding the people that were going to help you on this journey, like how long does that a process like that take? Well, I was under a very pretty strict deadline because I had gotten a grant and I applied for the grant on the intuition that there was a story. And I don't think I might, I will ever apply again like that because I mean, if I had not found people, I would, it would just not have happened. Like I said, timing is a lot of things in life. So I had only a couple of several months to find them actually. And it was really Wow. In the end, the executive director of the Western Growers Center for Innovation Technology, Dennis Donahue, who said, I think I have a couple of women at Trace Genomics for you to talk to. A woman named Pam Marone, who launched a company called Marone Bio Innovations, who actually mentored some women of color in the space. Dennis connected me with her, and then she just said, Yeah, I've got two or three women too. I'm a woman also, you know, in other words, it really, I got lucky with connecting. And then I think the whole process was a several months, but the several months was only planting the seed. It wasn't really at the actual fruition at all. The actual fruition came with me taking the film on the road and me seeing this positive response from different audiences and saying, my gosh, this needs to be screened more. We need to have more events, discussions, panels, kind of like the indoor ag tech summit. We need to have more gatherings. And then from there, I had yeah. more connections. And then that's when I was like, I want to write a book about it. I mean, some of the screenings and gatherings drew up to about 150 to 200 people. And we wow. fill every seat. And this was in 2018. And yeah, when I look back, it was pretty amazing. And it's kind of like now part of the history, I feel, from farms to incubators. It's part of this history that was essential in building it to what it is today. I've been told by a lot of people, I'm so surprised that you took this so far. And it's an interesting thing to be told because I never, first of all, planned on taking it so far, but I feel like it was just really important to collect and amplify, like you said, when you see another woman, when you see somebody who kind of looks like you doing something really interesting, you feel like you might want to connect. Yeah. And it's not to say that you're committed to doing what they're doing. It's just like, hi, how are you? Oh my gosh. Like I do this with book writing too. Like I had not written a book before. Well, if I see another woman who's an Asian American writer, I'll be like, wow, cool. Like, how did you do that? Like sometimes you just feel that connection. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You want to say a little bit about the work you do at the Hudson Valley Farm Hub? Yeah, I can certainly talk about that. That is my day job. And I think my work from with from Farms Incubators led me to that amazing place. 
I wear the hat of a communications manager there. So I'm also doing the same thing, storytelling, often taking photographs, often the person doing social media. But I will say that the work at the Hudson Valley Farm Hub truly aligns with my mission and vision to use agriculture as a platform to make a positive difference in society. So in the case of the Hudson Valley Farm Hub, it is growing produce, vegetables, and distributing it to emergency food systems in the area, in the region, pantries, SNAP programs. It's great to see people who unfortunately can't afford. (laughs) I mentioned the $15 cherries, but hey, everything is expensive now. Really, right? Yeah. It's just beautiful to see that the vegetables and the fruits are going for a really good cause. Not so that, you know, people are not just eating packaged processed foods, but locally, local fresh foods that also they can make delicious meals out of. And there's the other component of education and training that the farm, that the Hudson Valley Farm Hub is really committed to training new farmers, people who want to farm. And that aligns very much with what I believe in. You know, you have to train the next generation of young people to consider bringing their talents. Otherwise, nobody's going to be farming anymore (laughs) because increasingly the farmers are getting older or they're not old and their children might not be taking over their farms. Do we want all the farmland to go to housing development, to go to malls? I don't know. Then where are we going to grow the food? Ag land is really precious. It's like gold. So really hoping to keep that in the hands of a new generation. Yeah, what's interesting, I think, and I've seen it some on the indoor ag side from a marketing perspective, the use of these newer platforms like TikTok to do tell stories in a visual manner and some of the social channels. And I think, you know, some of that in a way pulls in a younger audience who is curious about what is being shared. And I think there is some crossover where some people who are interested in a new career can see those as an opportunity. And I think to your earlier point, there's not just farmer does not mean you know, person on the actual farm, like planting the seeds. And nowadays with the seed genomics yeah. <laughs> and all the data science you need and the people working and all the different technologies just on the indoor side with LEDs and robotics, there's so many opportunities to enter farming nowadays that are not limited. Yeah. And to your point, drones and just all this new technology that's being used right. to have much more success with your farm. I mean, absolutely. That's the message I'm trying to get across that food and farming can be sexy basically. And it's not just, it's not boring. I mean, I, like I noted, do not come from agriculture and farming myself. It's a passion. It's an interest. And I get a lot asked a lot by younger people or people like, how do I get into this? How do I explore this? Well, you just need a curiosity to ask questions. And I think, especially if you're a young person, just go to the farmer's market and start talking to some of the farmers there. Talk to some of the people selling the produce there. Say, I'm interested in this. And if you're taking a class, hopefully you're at a a university where there's some sort of food or farming related class. I really hope so. Increasingly, I'm seeing this in high schools, grade schools in the city, too. I think that they're incorporating gardens into the schools now also, which is beautiful. So I'm very positive about this. I mean, like if I can, if me, a city girl has fallen in love with agriculture and I can grow and I can also love this and I love to eat. I am positive that there are opportunities out there <laughs> for other women. And if you want to start your own agriculture, ag tech company, your own farm, I have numerous women who come up to me afterwards and say, my dream has always to be had my own farm. And they kind of look really shy when they say that. It's almost like their words are disappearing. I'm like, what did you say? Oh, well, I just sort of have this dream, you know, that maybe it's like, say it out loud. I would like to have yeah. a farm someday. And I really believe that if if you say it enough, if you're passionate enough, you're curious enough, it'll happen. I really, really believe that. Maybe it's partnering with somebody else who also has something similar, like similar mission. Like I feel like, Harry, you and I have some similarities, right? So it's finding somebody with some common passion, and then maybe you could do something together, or maybe you could find at least trade or share information together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's taking the initiative and putting yourself out of your comfort zone. Because even there's for all the women that have come to speak to you 
after a screening or after reading the book, there's probably a percentage that were too shy to come up to you or so. you know didn't know what to say or to share something. So I think letting folks know that there's a variety of ways to connect with people who are doing like-minded work, whether it's, you know, I have people sending me DMs on LinkedIn saying, I, I listened to your show, I'm starting a farm, I don't know where to start, but your stories have been inspiring me. So I'm like, okay, like, where else can I point you to? And just, you want to feed that, right. you know, fan that flame so that people don't lose the hope and, and they understand that there's a ton of different ways to enter this industry. I mean, I took a couple of skills that I had in podcasting and production. And I was like, well, and I wanted to learn about the industry. So I was like, well, let me put these together and I'll create my own platform because there was nothing that existed at the time. So in the same way you made the film and then you did the book. And I think just taking the initiative yeah. to create the opportunity that doesn't exist for you and just make your own way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the hopes of that down the road that from pharmacy incubators is want to do is to continue to tell the stories of women through interviews and through audio and through podcasting. But I'm a solo woman myself. So it's, I always find that if there are opportunities to partner or to work together to tell a story, whether it's like somebody else taking the photograph and me writing the story, or whether it's somebody, two people doing an interview or one person drawing the painting, I always find that there are just yeah. Ways to work together. It's very hard to actually be totally solo and do all of all do all the stories by yourself. Absolutely. So as we wrap up, Amy, given the audience, a lot of folks that are in the space that are in the industry listen to this show. Is there a specific ask you have for the listeners of this show? Yes, I would say my specific ask is to please, if you know of a woman in ag tech. A woman, she does not have to be the founder of a company. She could be a co-founder, a leader in leadership, and it does not have to be a startup. It could be working for a large ag company too. Please email me because we are expanding our portraits. We are launching our portrait section now. We want to have a diversity of women on that page. So please nominate her, you know, to be part of this by emailing me directly at amy at farms to incubators.com. Please check out our directory of women in ag tech. There's 800 plus names on there now. These are all women who submitted their own names. They want to be on there. They want to be connected with. Please go to the Pharmacy Incubators website and put and submit your name or get your friend to submit her name. My third ask would be that when we roll out our stories and when we put them out on our social channels, please share. Please reshare, share on your LinkedIn, on your Instagram, on your Facebook. Please use that as an opportunity to share out the stories. And then if you're interested in screening the film, in just seeing the book, in bringing the book to your, even go to your local library and say, can you please add this book to your collection? And the reason why I say that is so that the community can then see this book and be like, oh, interesting. Women in yeah. I did not know. So pay it forward. By just sharing, you don't have to necessarily be part of this storytelling team, although we would love to have you. We'd love to have a talent. I would love to hear from you. But in a very simple way of resharing and sharing what's out there, that would be my big ask. Yeah. Well, we'll make sure to reshare all the links that you mentioned and whatever's missing, just please get them to me. We'll make sure everything's in the show notes. So if you've been following along, then don't worry. We'll have, make sure everything's going to be in the show notes. Amy, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with me, telling your story, which is incredibly inspiring. I'm really glad we got a chance to connect. And I feel we're going to be probably like there's opportunities for us to partner on some future media projects. So I want to make sure we stay in touch. And I'm glad we were able to share your story. I would absolutely love that. And I will definitely look for opportunities to work together again. Thank you for all the good work that you're doing. Well. Thanks again to Amy for coming on the show and sharing her story. As always, full shows are available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. Stop by, take a look. We capture a summary, timestamps, key takeaways, resources mentioned, all in the hopes that we can get you focused on listening to the conversation without worrying about taking notes down, which is something that I do for podcasts that I'm really a fan of. I really appreciate Amy sharing her story and her time with us, and I'm so glad to get the word out about the great work she's doing at From Farms to Incubators. Special thanks to our Season 6 title sponsor, Cultivated. If you are looking into a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, here's an idea. Reach out to them today. Here's the best part. Their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. You can learn more at cultivated.com, and that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Leave out that lasty. 
podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Learn more at fullcast.co about how a podcast can be beneficial for you and your brand. If you are enjoying this show and you haven't already, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. We'll be sure to read those out on future episodes. Tune in next episode, another great conversation with the CEO of CityCrop, Christos Raftogianis. And hopefully I didn't butcher his last name. We really had a fun conversation. I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. Make sure you check that out. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published.